we go. You're going to record. Yes, thanks, Mice. I can't record anymore. That's Ashley now. There we go. Yay, and we're good. We're live. We're recording. Welcome, awesome. everyone. Welcome, Will. Uh, let's start with uh, what to expect today. Let me go over uh, really quickly, and then I'd love to hear uh, from the participants just to get connected and to build community to all these these things in times like this. Uh, so what to expect today? Number one is for us a time and space for us to come together as a community. And uh, I want to thank the coach training, the coach training ED team for their help in getting these set up, get like, all their support, all the things that are happening in the background. Uh, really thankful and excited. Uh, thank you, coach training ED team. And then thank you too to the coach training ED community. Thanks for supporting these, for the feedback that we've received over the past week. Uh, and we are inspired and energized to keep doing these and keep moving forward. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Two, we're going to explore the why and look at all the different coaching tools, the ideas. Uh, a lot's come from uh, Will's experience in, in building his uh, coaching practice. And then also uh, the third thing we're after is exercises. If we have time, we could go through some exercises ourselves to sharpen, clarify our why. And here we are. So welcome. Thank you, everyone. Will, I would love to start with just by thanking you. I know we've had a conversation last week. Uh, and uh, just jump in. Love to hear your story, where you're from. Uh, yeah, let's start with where you're from and how you got into academic life coaching. Absolutely. And let me just echo my gratitude to the whole community and uh, to you and the whole Coach Training EDU team for, for having me on. But uh, to dive right into my story, basically, uh, well, I'm from, originally I'm from a suburb outside of Chicago, Illinois, a place called Northbrook. So I grew up there and attended uh, high school there. And then now I'm located in Wisconsin. And I reside in a town called Nina. It's about halfway between Green Bay and Milwaukee in the Fox Valley. And, you know, being a typical Midwest kid, um, I was always interested in trying to serve others. That's really what drew me towards coaching, but also the different paths that I've had through life so far. So I was a high school English teacher for seven years prior to beginning my life coaching journey. And I think that whether I was in the classroom or following my other major passion in life, which was coaching and playing volleyball, the things that always tied it together for me were my passion for sharing passion with others and to try and, trying to help others become the versions of themselves that they wanted to become. And I began to feel a little restless in the classroom, like I could be doing more. And my whole metaphor that's kind of guided me through life has been to have this positive ripple effect across society. And I wanted to perhaps explore different ways to enhance that ripple effect. And as luck would have it, uh, my wife became pregnant in uh, 2018. And that also changed my perspective on a lot of things. And I began to think that maybe leaving the classroom for a little while to pursue different opportunities that would allow me to stay home and, and take care of my daughter and have this very special experience of sharing the first you know year of life with her so all of these things kind of combined to spark this desire in me to become a coach and i did a little bit of background research tried to pick a program that i thought would be the best fit for me and coach training edu ended up being that awesome program and and i can tell you why i i, I was drawn towards this community because of one, the strong foundation in coaching principles that were going to be delivered, but also just the immense support that was going to be offered along the way and the connections that I was going to be able to make while going through this experience. So all of those things really combined into bringing me to the point where I'm at today. Yeah, thanks, Will. It's one of the things I found most surprising when I, when I first started training. But looking back, it shouldn't have been surprising, but it was at the time, was the, the intensity of the connection between people on a training call, even if you weren't in the same space. And I think what we're experiencing now as a society is that these connections that we're having, even in a virtual space like this, they're still heart human connections. 
it's not like that part is still present. It's just not being in the same room and people are, I don't know. I think after people are incredibly adaptive, you know, after a couple of training sessions, it really does feel like you're in the same room. Uh, and, I couldn't agree more. Right, especially with webinars like this. But when we first started, it was phone. We just did the phone. And we had no, there was no training guide. There was no workbook. There was nothing. It just was a phone and a bunch of worksheets. And this was you know, 10 years ago now. Uh, so it, it feels like we've come a long way. And the world is now adapting to online. And so here, here we are, right? even in this conversation. So, Will, I'm curious, what was the... Uh, your story is so, it's so familiar. I mean, it's my, I mean, I taught for six years. Yes. You know, another humanities teacher. And uh, when the, our first daughter was born, that was when I decided to go out and find something and do something else and got coach trained and realized there was a huge gap in, you know, the academic world. Uh, I imagine this also takes the support of, you know, your whole family and, uh, what was the what was the moment when you knew that this was the path that you know that yes you had to stop teaching and go into coaching well you know i think if i had to pinpoint it to one moment it would probably be when my daughter actually arrived and that's a day that that you know obviously is special for a lot of reasons but my wife and I and my family had talked about different ways that I could continue to stay in the classroom, continue coaching in the ways that I was coaching in the athletic sense. And all those plans changed when she, she got here. And I, I think, you know, in a way I should have probably, probably been expecting that, but nothing in my experience truly prepares you for that moment. And seeing her just solidified in me the desire to want to have this positive impact that goes beyond just myself and my immediate family. And I thought that as a teacher and as an athletic coach, you can influence a certain number of people. But as a coach, you have this tremendous opportunity to influence others in a positive way and have that ripple effect expand through other people, not just through yourself. And that was most appealing for me and what really solidified that I needed to Press myself to grow in a new way in order to serve individuals the way that I was hoping to serve them. I feel that. I feel that. So when was she born? What? Uh, no, November twenty first of uh, twenty eighteen. All right. So you had like a November baby. And so did you have time then? Did you have enough time? Like after she was born, you had time to take off and. and Basically, yeah, yeah. I was still in the classroom when she was born. And, um, you know, there was a leave for paternity associated with that. And while I was on leave, that's actually when I was confronted with this unknown that I had never experienced before. For the first 28 years of my life, I had been in school or on a volleyball court. And now I was at home. And it was a very different environment for me. And that was what led me to realize that, one, I really couldn't imagine missing out on some of this time with her. And two, I had such a supportive school district that said, you know what, we're willing to grant you a leave of absence for the following year to allow you to pursue these dreams and have this time with your daughter. So I can't give enough thanks to the, to the district and for my family for taking this leap of faith. And it seemed like the stars just aligned and I'm very lucky. Wow, congratulations, that's, that's huge. Like that's a big deal. Like way to go school district. I know it. They, Wisconsin, right? Where do you go, Wisconsin? They took a chance on me, and I am, uh, you know, I'll be returning to the classroom next year to sort of pay these lessons that I've learned forward. And I think that uh, I don't think I know that I'm going to be a better educator, having learned the things I've learned as a part of coach training edu, and from trying to grow this business in my own way. And I'm just excited for what the future holds in a lot of different regards. I, I feel that, and I, 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 this is, yeah, I mean, this is. It's, it's blowing my mind to, to see the ripple effect of like you made to, to jump into a training, to build a practice, and now you're paying it back to in a classroom. I mean, this is best case scenario on many different levels. Uh, congrats, congrats on, the, on all of the milestones. Well, I really appreciate that. And I wouldn't be here today without the support of the entire community. So I'm, I'm just very grateful to be in the spot that I'm at. 
Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Let's do this. So let's, uh, so let's jump in and at Q and A. So if you have any questions or, or want to, uh, you know, ask questions, use the Q and A, uh, that enables everyone to see it. I know Ashley's on here as well. Uh, she can answer some questions. Uh, then we can all, I think everyone in the community can also uh, jump in on that. Uh, the chat just goes to Will and I and Ashley. So only, only us see the chat, but everyone sees the Q and A. Um, and then later we will have uh, a transcript of this posted on our blog and any feedback you have, any questions, any follow-up, things like that. If you want to go to our, uh, the coach training edu blog, and I think the uh, recording will be up within an hour. Uh, and, uh, and to, uh, if you could comment there, that would be amazing uh, for us on many different levels. And it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's just exciting to build this community and the, the energy that's being created here. I've just, I love it. I love it. Okay. So, uh, Will, let's jump in. Let's look at some, so when we talked, the thing that struck me the most was looking at, uh, your emphasis on why, right? Like developing your why, uh, developing, you know, helping the students you work with, what, what do you find so important about the why and purpose? Well, to me, John, the, the why is really the integral piece of clarity that I'm hoping to bring to the people I work with, because in my opinion, the why is the piece that brings all of these other goals that we might have for ourselves, whether they be personal goals or perhaps performance or outcome-based goals. The why brings these elements together. And the reason why I'm such a strong believer in that is because I feel like it's a pretty human emotion or a pretty human thought to sometimes wonder, why am I doing this while doing a task? And my biggest realization was that when you have that thought, your motivation levels are probably pretty low in that moment because you're doing something and you don't know why you're doing it. <laughs> so you can have all these lofty goals about who you wanna become and what you'd like to do but if you don't know why those things are important to you, I feel like that motivation isn't as strong as it could be if you had that why solidified. So that's what's really drawn me into trying to help the people that I work with clarify their why and what I've seen as having a tremendous impact in my own life, professionally and personally, when I solidified the whys in my life. Right, and so as you see the why, what is your why for establishing your coaching? It's taken me a long time to distill it down to its core element because I do think specificity is important. But so far, what I've been able to whittle it down to, my why for coaching is to help spread positivity and to enhance others to live the lives they want to live while being the people they want to be. And that's where I draw my passion is from helping others achieve these outcomes that they're hoping to achieve. So that really is my why, at least in this moment. And I do think that whys are adaptable. But for me, it's really about how can I serve others to help them achieve their dreams, for lack of a better word. Right, right. And so let's, uh, I just, I felt that. You know, I felt the, when you were, that is beautiful. Thank you. Uh, I always love hearing the, the journey of, you know, jumping from teaching to building a practice. That's always a journey and takes a lot of you know, effort, resilience. What were the elements in your path? Like, what, what were the, the key points or the elements in the path that you could share? I would be happy to. I think for anyone that's thinking about undergoing such an evolutionary phase or somebody that's in the midst of one now, the elements that I found to be most integral to reaching the point that I'm at now would be first and foremost clarifying what kind of service you're hoping to provide. I think that for me, life coaching at its onset can take so many different forms and I needed to clarify for myself what it is that I wanted to offer and who would be best served by those services. So it took me a little while to narrow down, you know, I really am passionate about working with younger people, um, students, student athletes, 
that range between middle school to college to some young adults too that have just graduated. So once I had that clarified, I also needed to figure out how am I going to get the word out there that I exist, that I have, that I have this, this service that I'm hoping to provide to others. So creating a website was a, a major element for me that I took a lot of time on and uh, I'm really happy with where it's ended up now, but it's definitely gone through many different iterations and uh, caused some frustration along the way. And, you know, I think the third element that's, that's important to going through this transition to opening your own practice is really doing this self inventory piece. And what I mean by that is really taking uh, the lens of life and turning it internally so that you can take a look at yourself and realize, again, it goes back to why for me, why am I hoping to you know, open up practice? Why am I hoping to go through this evolutionary phase professionally? And what do I possess that's going to serve me in this journey? And what do I need to learn in order to make these goals achievable in the end? And if I hadn't done that self-reflection before starting this journey, I don't think I would have moved through the process as efficiently as I've been able to move through it up until this point. Right. Yeah, I think what you're speaking to is that journey, that personal journey, you know, that that inner journey that anyone starting their own practice has to go through. And it's one of the tough, I think the entrepreneurial journey is one of the toughest journeys I know. And it's one that stretches people. Having, ha having that clarified why is so valuable. It shows up in the, the training as the difference, primarily the difference between like motivation for the sake of self versus motivation for the sake of other. Mm -hmm. And that empathetic motivation is so powerful. When you're in even your why, like what you're talking about, like everything is centered around what you can give to others. Uh, the exercise I find so uh, really empowering and everyone here can do it. Everyone uh, in the, participating right now, uh, if you get out a piece of paper, and you look at, uh, write, it, write the goal down. So, so Will, what's the goal in the next month? What, what is your, yeah, what, what's the big like reach goal for you in this next month here? So my reach goal in this next month, um, even with everything that's going on, you know, societally these days, I still am hoping to expand and work with spring sports teams at the collegiate level. So that's my, my big goal that right now is I've done some work with athletic programs, but I've mostly been in the realm of volleyball. Volleyball is a fall sport here in Wisconsin at the collegiate level. I'd love to expand into other sports to serve other athletes. Right, and so, excellent, excellent. And so when, uh, when you think about what that means for your business, what that means for you personally, for the number of clients you have, uh, the number of contracts and money you bring in, what do you notice happens to your level of stress and anxiety? I mean, it definitely goes up when considering this new opportunity that I'm, I'm hoping for, but there always is that other side of it that time was already taxed prior to adding this new, you know, orb to juggle. And the stress levels do sort of tend to increase when you start to aim for these loftier future outcomes for yourself. Right, 100%. And I, when we, uh, I had uh, biofeedback once for a period of time where they would put, you know, participants would clip their ear with uh, something that measured heart rate variability. Uh, and whenever there was anything either positive or negative that they were thinking about themselves, their heart rate variability would, uh, uh, was, I forget the increase or decrease, but the way that they were, it, the biofeedback said it would stress them out. Like it would show, no, you're under more stress right now. But when they started shifting towards gratitude and shifting towards this is what I want to do for others. So let's, let's shift it and let's look at that. What impact would you like to have? Or what's the, what's the image that comes to mind of the impact that if you follow through on this, what would happen? So the impact that I'm hoping to achieve by taking this next step would be, you know, I have this end vision of the team that I'm hopefully lucky enough to work with, or maybe even teams, um, that their athletes feel fulfilled on the court, but also off the court or the field or the diamond or whatever it ends up being. And their team also experiences a level of success 
that they are going to be happy with. And I know that different programs and different teams have different goals for wins, losses, end of the season outcome. To me, those things are secondary to the fulfillment you find through this process. And that's why I always draw the distinction for people I work with between success and fulfillment, because I'm hoping to bring this level to, to the athletes I work with in this context of fulfillment and the experience of athletics in the broader sense. Right, right. Yeah, in my mind, my why always throughout the very beginning when I started coaching in 2005 to when I started full time in 2008 was uh, this image of a, a sophomore, both in college or in high school and feeling all the frustration, feeling the judgment of grades, feeling the pressure of all the things that needed to, to happen and realizing that the the work that coach training edu is doing is making a difference on the life of that student like that's that's the that's what we need to be doing that's that's the thing and so the question is if you were to go out and try to make an impact on the lives of a thousand people in the next week what would you do that's the question and it's a question that we ask in the biz launcher program it's a question that it's there. I, I think about it quite often. And it's, it's been a guide that Amoist and I, we ask ourselves, how can we, how can we design something that we know can have this impact? That's the formula. It's such a wonderful why. I think if I can just interject to, to show some, uh, some gratitude for that why that you're expressing, just because I think that when you shift the perspective in that way and focus on how this experience is going to change the lives of others, you're, you're absolutely right that that perspective switch leads to the lowering of the stress, the enhanced motivation that we're all looking for in order to fulfill these grand goals that we have for ourselves. So I couldn't agree more that that why is just perfectly clarified in my mind. It's like what I think what you experienced too when, I mean, working with the school and the school district, they saw it too, uh, where it's this, this element from, of, okay, I'm, I'm, I want to start, start a coaching practice because I want, I want fulfillment. Like I want to be able to work with people that in a fulfilling way, uh, that's definitely in this space. But when it starts to shift to realizing, wow, I'm actually having an impact. And when you start to realize that impact and you see it, your first few clients are, you know, yes, they're, you know, uh, you know, they're helping you form your foundation. You know, they're, they're helpful because you're getting some income. It's helpful because you're, you know, now instead of everything being theoretical, it's, you know, tangible. But the biggest thing is the reminder of how awesome coaching is in the context of their lives. Because I remember coming back from coaching sessions thinking, this is the most amazing thing ever. Like this, I feel like the cat that, that swallowed the canary. Like this is like, this is going to change the face of education. Like shouting, I mean, we're like driving down, like I-5 shouting in my like, you know, Jeep, like after coaching session, like, you know, listening, this is it, everyone. Like education changed. Uh, how many moments like that? Well, I, I can't begin to count them but especially as I was beginning my journey, they were what I latched onto to fuel my desire to grow further. And, and I couldn't agree more that education needs to go through this evolutionary process where they need to incorporate these, these coaching elements into how we educate children. And you know, one of my favorite TED Talks is Sir Ken Robinson's Do Schools Kill Creativity? And, and I'm on his side. I think that a lot of the times these young students are being taught that their passions aren't the things that are going to serve them moving forward and i think they need somebody in their corner that's going to champion them and challenge them to be that version of themselves that they want to be and do those things that they want to do and that's what i'm hoping to to have in in my future as well i, I totally focus on that one student similar to to your sophomore that is unclear about how to move forward and then hopefully through a conversation with me or through somebody I've worked with or through somebody at all, they gain that clarity and find that inner peace that's going to move them forward. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I once saw uh, 
Ken speak at a conference and I got there early and sat in the front row and he was late. He was an hour late. The airplane, <laughs> the airplane was late. He flew up from Portland to Portland. And uh, so we're all just there. We're doing our thing. He's there. And so he, he is in a hotel uh, in Vancouver, Washington. And uh, he goes and he goes for three hours. And it just was like, I was a pinnacle of my life. And I took a, this embarrassing photo afterwards of me looking completely <laughs> starstruck next to Ken. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he's a hero. He's, his main point, the, the idea is that can we have literacy, can we, can we treat creativity as important as literacy? And I want to add to that and coaching can augment that in, in having to treat empathy and listening as important as speaking and communicating. But the, it's the ability of, of teaching deep, authentic, empathetic listening is what I see is missing in our training. Wow, you know, like what if? And a lot of times I think what happens when people get coached, it feels like they're drink, they, they, it's like drinking water before you even know that you were thirsty. You know, you're like, I wow, I've never had anyone like that. You know, like, that's amazing. It truly is. And, and that metaphor it hits home for me as well, because one of the ways that I try to explain coaching and how it's different from everyday conversation is the way that when you're in a coaching conversation, one party is truly there to be that empathetic listener without an agenda that serves themselves. And in everyday conversation, 99% of the time, in my opinion, if two parties are speaking, they both have an agenda that they're hoping to carry through the conversation. And that's what makes coaching so special. You are offering this space to an individual to truly make it their own. And if students, if athletes, if anybody has that experience, I think they're going to really see the benefits of having these kinds of opportunities and really grow from them as well. Um, so let's do this. Let's, let's shift in some exercise. Like let's sharpen the exercise and let's answer some of these questions and then we'll shift into Q and a. Uh, Absolutely. And so we have, I want to try this. Uh, so Joyce, I Joyce saw that Peter, were they on your? Joyce uh, and Peter were fellow peers of mine in my uh, 1.0 academic life coaching course from last spring to, to early this fall. And I just wanted to say thank you to them so much for the very kind comments and they were a joy to work with. And I, I am forever grateful for the peers that have been in my classes along the way. And it goes back to what you were saying, John, about the connections you form they really become your little family, your little tribe. And I am so grateful to have the support that I've had and everybody's been so wonderful. And Joyce and Peter definitely included in that group. That's fantastic. It's uh, yeah, I know, I, it, I, I, I know that group and uh, it warms my heart every time I think about the impact that coach training and coaching is having in the world. And uh, Joyce and Peter, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it, uh, I, I pressed the answer live. I'm not sure what that button does, if it allows you to speak as well. Uh, but if so, uh, we will see how it goes. All right, I guess not. Uh, I, and then Eileen, uh, what are some good websites to advertise your coaching services? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I didn't do a lot of advertising uh, when I was building my, my coaching practice. Uh, I think that there are, one, one thing that's useful is to think about who also shares your audience with you. Like, so who, so let's say you're working with uh, sports teams or you're working with um, uh, uh, whoever um, is asking, okay, so um, what do you, like, uh, you reach out to them. So let's say you also want to work with uh, sports teams, you reach out to the coaches of the sports teams. You want to work with schools from the standpoint of how can you reach as many students as possible? I used to start at the top. I would reach, I would go for um, uh, the principals. I went to talk to the principals. I talked to the superintendents. I sent emails to superintendents. Uh, and uh, it's an odd thing, but oftentimes the superintendents have the most time to talk about these bigger ideas because not many people go straight to the superintendent. Uh, 
and it seems like it more works its way up. Or I would talk to a principal and then the principal would talk to the superintendent and they would say, oh, great, let's put this on. And then I got it in one school. Now you have six schools. Uh, so, Will, you, you also mentioned, like, you want to talk a little bit about, about how you built your practice. Absolutely. I, I did a very similar thing to you, John, as reaching out to the, the people that I was hoping to work with directly. Um, but beyond that, I've really found that it may not be an individual website uh, or something like that for advertising, but social media is increasingly a way to connect with prospective clients, but also just the community at large. And I'm a person that will freely admit that prior to this experience was not very heavily active on social media. And it's still something that brings up some anxiety and um, uncomfortability within me. But putting yourself out there on social media and letting people know what you're about and who you're hoping to work with, I just think that transparency is, is maybe one of the, the greatest things that I learned along the way is that you don't have to hide or make things mysterious you can be direct when trying to promote the services that you have and reach out to the people that you think would benefit from them. And you'd be surprised the, the feedback that you're going to get back, but don't let fears block you from taking those steps. I know that that was something that was in my way for a long time, but once I clarified that why further and got those inhibitors released, I was able to take some necessary steps forward. Right. Right. I think it could guide in what I've, what I've experienced now, you know, running a coach training company is, or organization is looking at the, the kinds of uh, websites, the kinds of organizations I want, I like, the kinds of people I want to be friends with and think and get inspired by, uh, those are the websites I reach out to. And it's a conversation. It's, it's about, it's basically forming a relationship and asking, uh, you know, letting them know, I really like your, I really like what you're, what you do, what you're about, and this is what I do. And my favorite definition of networking is the giving and sharing of information. That's networking. It's letting people know what you need and learning what other, like in learning from others what they need most. Uh, and because I mean, as a teacher, right? Like what, what business experience did we have establishing practices? It was like, go. <laughs> Go forth and get clients. Uh, but after a certain point in time, you really have to take that step and get a little strategic about it. Uh, and it's amazing. Uh, almost every everyone I talk to who makes it, they, there are usually two or three sources or people who are like super huge referral engines. And But it takes a while to find those referral engines. And it doesn't happen... Uh, but then that, that's when they start to build on itself. Like I, I found you know, there, was, there was a senior portrait photographer who referred like 10 people to me in one month. And I know you have some super referrers as well. Absolutely, yes. I forgot to mention that in my initial answer, but I think referrals are such a great way to partner with other organizations that you're also a supporter of and form these symbiotic relationships. So I've actually aligned myself with several different counseling uh, practices uh, throughout a couple of different states and we provide referrals both ways so if somebody approaches me for coaching that would really be better served by counseling I'm able to send them to the services that they really need and vice versa will occur or sometimes even our services occur in tandem because I do believe that the use of one can even enhance the use of other in certain circumstances so it's been really great to see this whole different community come together and interweave itself with my community in order to help people be in the best possible spot. And I think that's what, again, it always comes back to the people you want to work with and what you're hoping for them. Right. Oh, that's lovely. I mean, I remember, I, I remember getting up so early and connecting with other entrepreneurs at the, or, you know, other business people at the, at the Chamber of Commerce meetings and talking about, you're know, trying to just make connections. And I realized very quickly that making those connections and, and being in, in touch with other people who are on similar paths, that human connection is, I mean, it's, it's so valuable to connect with other people uh, in, in the process of you know, building a practice. Um, all right, so we have some other questions here. Uh, what is from Albert, how difficult, how difficult was it to narrow down to the segment that you were working with and 
yeah, speak to that process. I could definitely jump in, Jen. Yeah. Okay. So I think the process of narrowing down the target population that I was hoping to work with was definitely a, a longer one in terms of the different facets that went into to my business building. I think that that's part of the self inventory is really asking for me, it was asking myself this question, who am I most passionate about working with? Who brings out the best in me? And those were students and student athletes. And once I had that clarified, I began to think, okay, now how am I going to be able to expand into this target population and let them know that these services are out there? So the process, I think, starts at this very general level of who do you want to work with? But then once you kind of narrow that down and decide this is going to be my niche or my demographic, the next phase of it was still that why. Why are these the people that I'm interested in serving. And I had to clarify that too, in order to truly stay motivated to be on this path. And that why for me became young people to me just have, I think all people have limitless potential. And I think that we all need to continue to recognize that growth is possible at any stage that we're in. But young people inherently have all this time ahead of them. And they are still looking to find that fulfillment in life. And I wanted to help them find that fulfillment so that they can go out and help make the world an even better place long after I'm gone. And when my daughter arrived, I mean, that was part of it because I wanna make the world a better place for her or help make the world a better place for her. But I hope that she goes out and makes the world a better place for other people. And it's just this kind of domino effect that we're hoping to, to take forward. So that was a bit of my process, I think. I think self inventory though is key in deciding what's going to fuel you in this line of work. I, I love that he talk about, cause it's so congruent, like your own internal why lines up with an audience and then working with an audience, you, you go a, a step even deeper into the why to so why student athletes, and then to take another step even deeper into that, and then you, it turns back to yourself. Well, what, is, what does that bring out in me? And then how, it's this cycle, this endless cycle of what does that bring out in me? How is that showing up externally? How is getting deeper externally, bringing stuff up in me? Like it's the cycle that you, what you're talking about. Exactly. What I find uh, when people, you know, I've, I've seen dozens of people you know, establish successful life coaching practices. Some of the key characteristics are uh, a willingness to um, narrow down your target audience. And inevitably, even myself included, when I went through that process, there's fear because you feel like you're excluding people. You're not working with whole populations of people. Uh, but that, I think that's the, the big surprise is that the more narrow you make it, the, more, the easier it is to attract people to it. Uh, and you can only really work with any coach can only really work with 20 to 40 people. Like, that's about it. 40 is your upper limit capacity. So you think about, does this group have at least 40 people in it? Good. Okay, great. Like you're going to be okay. You know? Uh, and the, the, fu the, 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 not funny thing, but the, the thing that I find the most ironic about it is that the more you limit your practice, the more other people want to be into that group, even if they have nothing to do with that group. Like, I'm, I'm sure you've experienced it as well. Absolutely. It's once you have this, this target demographic, you think that's who's going to find you, but people find you from all different walks of life. And that's the exciting part is that coaching really can serve anybody. And if you're willing to serve others in that capacity, then there's no limit to uh, the kinds of opportunities that are going to knock on your door. Right. Right. And so it's a lot about, um, you know, it's just people will assume if you're an expert in one thing that you're also an expert in other things. Like if you're an expert in helping, you know, students or student athletes go through, you know, visualization process to help them become better volleyball players, they think, well, can you do that with my, you know, my team? Can you help my company team use visualization for us to communicate, you know, communicate more effectively? Or, uh, I've had the parents of the students I was working with, ask if I could go and go into, uh, you know, basically present at 
to their corporate headquarter office. And this is when I was still teaching Latin. And I remember thinking to myself, here I am, a Latin teacher in a corporate office, knowing nothing about the corporate world. Like I am such a Latin geek in this <laughs> world of corporate. Uh, I couldn't help it, but it went okay. It was, you know, it wasn't the best workshop, but it went okay. But even then, that was my entry into executive coaching, where they they wanted more. They that that launched that that branch of it. Um, and so I think that's the process. I mean, I think initially. I would look at focusing in on your target audience as a, a six month to one year exercise. Like for six months, just focus as much as you possibly can and then see what happens. Uh, and it's, it's a little bit of a trial and error process, um, but most people who make it draw from past experience. Like there's something in their past, like this, like you with teaching a volleyball, it makes sense. You now me as a high school, Latin teacher. Yeah, it makes sense. I'd work with high school students. It, there usually is that, oh yeah, that makes sense type of element to it as well. Uh, Chuck, what's your question, Chuck? Uh, besides what you have already talked about, what is another piece of advice to someone who's just starting out? Would you say, well, someone who's in, let's say week three or four of the training? Gosh, you know, I think back to, to that point in, in my experience, in my journey, and I wish somebody would have told me that self-belief is gonna take you pretty far. And you need to lose the limiting beliefs that may be attaching themselves to you at this point. I know for me personally, I let a lot of these beliefs creep in. Like, you don't have any business opening a business. You're not a businessman. You aren't going to be able to sustain yourself this way. You aren't going to get client. Things like that are thoughts that I think naturally creep in when you're taking this leap into the unknown. And I think that my advice would be to look at those limiting beliefs. Don't just hold on to them and tolerate them, but investigate them. Get into it and see why do you have this assumption? Why do you have this belief? And how is it serving me or not serving me? And then you can figure out how to move forward more efficiently. But to distill that message down to, to maybe a little bit more of a clear one would be just believe in yourself that this is possible. And if you believe that it's possible and you have that vision and it's clear in your mind, it's achievable. And I think that's the powerful, one of the powerful things that I learned through my coaching journey uh, in terms of the courses was that there's so much power behind belief and clarity. And if you have those two elements and you know what you wanna do and why you wanna do it, then you're probably going to be able to achieve that outcome in the end. Right. Right. And that's the benefit of being in the, in the program where a large part of it is coaching and being coached, right? Where you have this opportunity to bring up all of these things in your coaching sessions when you're the practice client. Uh, I recommend that. I feel like it's absolutely. Like you need to feel and and you need to feel like what it's like to be a client i feel like that's just as important and that's how i got into it i always got into coaching and then uh, she uh, took a coach training class and i was the guinea pig for her people going through the class and i remember those first coaching sessions i still remember like where i was in the room when i was being coached uh and uh, it made such an impact on me that I thought, why, why now? Like, why am I only having this conversation now? Like, I wish I had this conversation 10 years ago when I was still in school. You know, it wasn't it was still fairly early, but still. And uh, my introduction to coaching was from the client side. Uh, and that's value. I mean, it's valuable to feel like what it is to, to be a client. Um, the other thing, my very first coaching session ever after a weekend of being trained I had my practice client lined up and we coached for about 25 minutes and she hung up on me halfway through. It was supposed to be an hour of session. She took 25 minutes into it. I was that bad. I was that <laughs> bad that they hung up. So if your practice client does not hang up on you, congratulations. Like you are, that's good. Like good, good one. Uh, it, it's okay. It's okay to, to, to start not good. You <laughs> to start bad. Uh, and I know what I did, and this is why, you know, the, the coach training, uh, Eileen's one hung up on you too. Congrats. <laughs> Welcome to the hang up club. It's terrible, isn't it? 
it was about, I spent five minutes trying to, to call her back, like, like a high schooler who had no self-control. Uh, <laughs> trying to get onto, you know, finally she hung, like after five minutes, she picks up the phone again. And I was staying, I was with a college friend. He was uh, in school to be a counselor. He was the absolute very best person ever in the world to be in that space with. So I finally, we got reconnected. And the second half was better, but still. She was rude. Sorry to hear that, Eileen. Uh, um, one thing I know is that, and this is the biggest thing that I see with all new coaches, myself included, and it took me about two years to get this in my bones, was when I'm in a coaching session, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm not problem hunting. I'm not trying to be clever or trying to justify the worth of coaching. That's simply listening empathetically and with curiosity and staying in curiosity, asking yourself as a human being, what am I most curious about as this, like, what am I most curious about in this other human being? That level to listening, that's all you need. That will take you 60% of the way there. Everything else are tools and structures for your curiosity. And I wish I had got that from the very beginning because it took about two years of painful, like, I don't know, solution hunting until I realized, okay, let, let, let it go. Like, it's all about curiosity. That would be my advice to anyone starting out right now uh, in, in the coaching world. And Eileen, like, I feel like we should form a club or something. Like, clients have hung up on me, club, uh, as, <laughs> as coaches. Have you ever had anyone hung up, hang up on you, Will? You have I, am, I have not had the hang up, but a lot of my beginning sessions were in person. So they were polite enough not to walk out and leave the room. But I, I felt the same things that I think all beginning coaches feel, which is that this isn't as good as it could be. But I think what you're speaking about really gets to the heart of that growth mindset that I think that is so important when you go on this journey and really to hold in life. If you're able to keep a growth mindset and realize that failure is simply an opportunity to grow, then you're going to be able to continue to serve yourself and serve others as you continue on this journey. And to me, keeping that failure in perspective. I've had countless failures as I've, I've learned to, to build this business. And each one I've been able to look at, feel, and then move on from. And I think that that's an important process too, is not letting things bog you down, but recognizing that there are opportunities rather than closed doors. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, in coaching speak and motivation speak, it's looking at the difference between extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation where, or this external versus internal motivation and the, the, the um, where, where those line up. So if you're thinking about, and I, I always thought about myself as like a, a factory. Like if I, my productivity were a factory, uh, my productivity is, you know, over here and then the results are over here. And I try to keep those things separate. Like, you know, not get too amped on results or too down on the results but to maintain the focus on the factory and just moving forward. How do you, or what, what's your, how do you keep the factory, you know, the results separate from the factory or do you mix them? Like what's your, what's your process? I think my, my process is very similar, but the metaphor that I usually use, it goes back to sports for me because that's been a major part of my life. And uh, I've had tough losses. I think that that anybody that's an athlete or not understands the, desire of you really want something to occur and it doesn't occur. And for me, being able to keep the things separate takes place within my mind where I compartmentalize things and picture it as little different boxes. And each result that I experience is just simply one box that gets filed into this filing cabinet that I use to learn from and move forward. So it's a little bit of a mix of the, the teaching and the coaching, but together I'm able to compartmentalize experiences and recognize that they're all serving this greater end vision that I have for myself. Yeah, I love the metaphors. They matter. The metaphor matters. It it's, does. Jonathan Haid, he has a book uh, that I really appreciate about the, the happiness and the way the mind works. And he says the metaphor is not of our minds. It's not necessarily a computer, but it's more like uh, a rider on an elephant where we have this, you know, this big elephant that wants to, you know, seek after comfort. And then we have a rider who's kind of in control, but not really, uh, you know, our consciousness, like, trying to figure out what we're all doing here. Uh, but that the metaphor really matters because if you have the metaphor right, then it lines up with 
you know, it models what's happening well, then you, you have more awareness to know, okay, so which way am I going? You know, how, how can I navigate this? In uh, the metaphor, even like going back to the why and looking at, uh, you know, let's, let's look at, you know, next, let's do a quick exercise, right? With our why. Absolutely. About 10 minutes left. This is perfect. Uh, so uh, if you were to break down finding a why into three steps, well, what would the, what would the three steps be? So the first step in finding a why for me is always trying to start with what's motivated you to pursue this outcome. So starting with that initial part of the process, I think that's a great entry level stage for getting into a thorough investigation of a why. So what is the initial motivation? Exactly. Excellent. And I also find it's helpful sometimes to not ask clients what that outcome is. I think that in coaching, a lot of times we're served by the less we know, the better. And I'll just sometimes ask, well, what's a why you'd like further clarity on? And then once, if they have something, what's the initial thing that's motivating you towards this outcome? And then right. we just go from there. Right. When you unpack your own why or unpack someone else's why, what do you find yourself most curious about? I'm really curious to get to the base value that is driving this train forward in the, in the metaphorical sense. I, I want to distill it down to, you know, a, a word or a, a succinct sentence if possible, that is the thing that you're honoring in yourself by doing this or wanting to become this or whatever the outcome is that we're looking for. Right, right. What is that for you? What's the, what's the core? Empathy. If I had to put it in one word, I think empathy is for me the biggest thing that I am honoring in, in all the facets of life that I'm a part of and all the roles and hats that I, different hats that I wear. I think empathy is what I'm hoping to honor as I move forward. So that's awesome. The, the, idea, the idea too, I feel like empathy is the answer for almost every business question. Like what's my next step? How do I, like, where do I advertise? What do I, how, you know, how can I serve? Uh, what should I put on the website? I mean, the, it's all, it's all, it all feels like putting yourself in someone else's time, like, you know, shoes and time and energy. What's it like to be them? Uh, I was, uh, I was, was that our conversation? We we're talking about uh, this idea of, no, it was different. It was a different conversation. Uh, it was an overview I was doing. And the person I was, I was overviewing, I was talking about this process of, I listen to someone and imagine if I were in the same circumstance, what would I do? And I feel like that's relatively good, right? That that's a good entry point to empathy, right? Like that's where, and that works a lot of the time. The coaching shifts that subtly to, if I were the other person, right? I put myself in the other person, I am that other person from that perspective, what would I do? So it's going over there on the other side and it's not bringing them to you, but you to them. Uh, so I feel like even empathy, like there are different qualities of empathy, uh, but empathy is the answer, like always the answer uh, to almost every business question, uh, even here. Right? Totally agree. My why, I love that moment of insight. I, I remember, uh, wasn't there a book in uh, going around, uh, Do Robots Dream of Electric Sheep? Yes. Is that the book? Like, you know, like it's popping around high schools and I picked it up out of the free bin and mm -hmm. I had it. And this is back before little ones and I actually had free time. <laughs> and I, I, in, isn't there an empathy box in that or is it a different book? Like, that's, that's, ringing, that's ringing bells. I think you, you are correct. You put your hands on the empathy box and you, you, you transport into the television and you are the main character and you feel what they feel and all those kind of things. It's our new way that we're going to watch movies 100 years from now. That's what I felt when I first listened to a client. I felt that empathy in that moment of, wow, like it's a whole new world opened up. It was like a whole new opportunity of curiosity opened up. And I think what coaching does is it gives you parameters on how to connect like that in a way that feels that 
you're still providing value and of service that you're not giving them judgment or, and I think that's where the problem hunting comes into play. Or, you know, that's where like, if you're judging or am I doing well or not doing well, that totally shuts down a, a session. Uh, and I think many new coaches are judging themselves, but the clients don't know that. They feel like the client, from the client standpoint, there's just judgment in the space. Uh, and like, new coaches, I wish I had realized this at the very beginning, simply just listening provides more than half the value. Just listening and giving people a chance to talk is more than half the value. Everything else is fancy and, you know, PCC, MCC stuff. We just fancier versions of that. But that's, that's it, basically. Um, we have one more question here. This, uh, I'm just starting out from Karen. I'm just starting out in the 1.0 wellness course. I've been able to secure a couple practice clients, but advertising for paying clients scares me. Common fear, how do you overcome it? Thoughts, Will? I can echo that I've, I've been there. I've shared that fear. I think the first step to advertising to clients that you'd like to, to pay for the services, for me, it was recognizing that this service is valuable. I think that was part of the internal reflection piece was coming to terms with, you know what, this is a, a service that people would be happy to pay for in some circumstances because it will help them become the people they want to become and do what they want to do. And then once I was able to kind of get over that initial internal block, I think externally I had to figure out, okay, well, how am I going to do that advertising? That was the, the contact piece that you were discussing, John. How can I reach out to the people that I'd like to work with? And my questions were very similar to yours when I was having those conversations. I always like to open with, you know, what's one way that I could help you grow? Or what's this vision that you have for, like if it was a coach, what's this grand vision you have for your team? What would you like to achieve? And then I, whatever they would say, I'd always ask, well, how can I help you achieve that? And just listening to what they have to say and then seeing what their priorities are and tailoring your pitch to these prospective clients, I think is a really individualized approach, but an important one to take. So that's kind of my perspective on, on how to start navigating into the realm of paid clients. Exactly. And once you start looking and trying to pay you know, once you start having, uh, you know, paying money for advertising, that's a scary bridge. I mean, I, even now I'm on that bridge and it's a scary one sometimes. I, I'm a big believer in, in test, test it out. Like the, whatever you can do to give like a little test, try it and see what happens. you in my experience, it's either an immediate yes or an immediate no. Sometimes it's, uh, we're not sure, but usually it's crickets or it's a waterfall. And uh, I've experienced both. And I think that the main thing is I would use the advertising as uh, from a growth mindset experimental. Like, is it, you know, how can I learn about myself in this process too? What can I learn about the website? What insights do I have? Uh, if I'm getting people to my website and I'm putting a lot of money in ads, I want to test it out ahead of time and like with a website heat map, like see where people are looking at, what they're clicking on, is it working, is this site working well? Uh, and using using the advertising as a, uh, how do we say it? Uh, a goad to get your website really, really solid. Uh, that's, that's where I think uh, advertising is at its best. Not necessarily what you get from it, but what the advertising forces you to do and respond to. That's the real value of, of initial advertising. And even now I feel it on different levels. Um, yeah, thanks, Karen. It's a super common fear. The bottom line, the way I overcome it is I look at what can I learn from this advertising and oftentimes the lessons learned are more valuable than the advertising itself. Okay, there we go. Another one of our Brazilian series. Will, it's, it, it's a pleasure to have you. It's an honor that you took uh, the Coach Training EDU Academic Life Coaching Program and are using it in the way you're using it, the clients you're using it with, and now to bring it back to the school system. It warms my heart to, you have no idea how much this, uh, this means to us in the community. Uh, thank you. And for those uh, watching here, uh, please, this, uh, this recording will be up uh, on our blog in about an hour. If you could visit the academic, 
our, the, the coach training edu uh, blog in the academic section and uh, share a couple comments there that would really help our site out and get this series launched. Uh, and with enough uh, support, I think we're gonna continue doing this. Next Thursday is Sonia, she's from Kenya, uh, Sonia Bandari, and she does uh, self-defense with uh, girls in Nairobi. Uh, it's up this Thursday. Will, thank you. Last words of, of wisdom. Oh, I don't know how wise they'll be, but I, I just want to say thank you to everyone and uh, to you, John, and the whole team, and, and just for this amazing opportunity to, you know, share my perspectives with, with this amazing community and to continue learning from each other. I think that that's what's so exciting about this series in general for me is that I get to experience all these cool uh, people and, and connect in ways that I hadn't imagined. So I just, uh, I'm very grateful for everyone that took the time and everyone that will take the time and... I just can't say thank you to Coach Training EDU enough for everything it's given me and everything that it's giving to the people I'm working with. And I can't wait to see that continue to grow in the future for that ripple effect to, to continue to expand. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Will. Yeah, it's, uh, it's exciting to see it. And uh, it's exciting to see the, the community grow and the organization uh, just become you know, even you know, more and more capable of providing a stronger foundation for others. So thank you for this. Thank you, everyone. I hope to see you in two days, Thursday, 9 a.m., same idea. You can go to the website for more details. Thanks for taking part in this Coach Training EDU Resiliency Series. Bye, everyone.